So welcome to St Mary's. My name's Father Grant Cohen, and we begin with the reading, which is from John's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning at verse 5. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty again and have to come to this well. Jesus said to her, go and call your husband. I have no husband, she said. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not even your husband. What you have said is true, the woman said to him. Sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came and they were astonished that he was speaking to a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking to her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and went on their way. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see that the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labour. Others have laboured and you have entered into their labour. Many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard it for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the saviour of the world. Getting ready for church, Tim's mum handed him a five pound note. This is for the collection, she said. But as the plate went round, Tim held on tightly to the note. Do you know where boys go if they don't put their money into the collection plate, his mum said. Yes, he replied, to the cinema. Unamused, his mum decided to use some more creative reasoning. You really don't want that money, she whispered in his ear. Quick, drop it in the plate, it's tainted. Horrified, the boy obeyed. But after a few seconds, he whispered, but mum, why was the money tainted? Is it dirty? Oh no, she replied, it's not dirty. It just ain't yours and it ain't mine. It's God's. 
I don't know how many times I have washed my tainted hands this week in order to keep this horrid virus at bay. All of us are having to change the way that we do things. Increasing the amount of times we wash our hands is just maybe one of the ways that we constantly ask ourselves, have I touched someone or something that might cause me to become infected? I can't help but think if only we felt the same way about sin and its effects upon our souls. That reading from John's Gospel was about touching the unclean. The Samaritan woman was on her own at the well. She wasn't Jewish, she wasn't rich, she wasn't holy. She was, for most, someone who was dirty. And no good Jew would have ever given her the time of day except one. No self-respecting rabbi would have even talked to this Samaritan woman because she was a Samaritan. She was there on her own and she had pretty loose moral history. So Jesus had a lot to lose by being there and yet he touched her at her point of need. I guess what many of us are asking is where should we be in this time of crisis? What should our response as a church be to the coronavirus? Throughout history, the church has always been at the heart of the need. It's building and it's people a sign that God is here for you no matter what. Jesus, of course, was always reminding people that he hadn't come to congratulate the self-satisfied and morally complacent, those who could so easily mouth pious platitudes but were bereft of pious attitudes. At the heart of his teaching was that we should be a people of self-sacrifice, a people ready and willing to emulate our Lord. The people Jesus chose to be his closest were certainly not the best. The people he spent his time with were not the cleanest or the healthiest, but they were the ones who needed him. Someone asked me the other day, why is this happening? Where did this virus come from? A reasonable question, but I had no answer. An article published by a journalist on Friday argued that God had sent the coronavirus to punish humanity for losing its way. With no meetings in the Vatican, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia banning Umrah pilgrims from all over the world and Bethlehem on lockdown, the coronavirus, says this journalist, is God's new story of Noah's flood to the earth. Could he be right? Jesus lived and taught that religion is about a relationship with God, who favours mercy over judgment, who loves us with an everlasting love, who touches the leper, who embraces the prostitute who prefers the poor and who forgives unconditionally, casting our sins as far as the east is from the west. So despite our why questions, let us never think that God pours out illness on people because he is fed up with them. For it is when these things occur that he is ever present and near, not walking away in displeasure. There was a great film called The Panic Room, released in 2002, which I just loved. In it, Jodie Foster plays a wealthy single mum with a teenage daughter. Moving into a large and beautiful house, there is a panic room at the heart of it, a fortified, high-tech room where you can go if you are in danger. It had provisions, a separate phone line, and video monitors that looked over the whole house, and no one could get you in there. The panic room was intended to be a safe, secure hideaway to hide until the danger passed away. As the plot unfolds, the women have to get into the panic room for safety because their lives are in danger. But what they discover is that the panic room becomes a trap as well as a safe haven because the daughter needs her medicine without which she will die. But it's in the other room and there is something nasty lurking outside the door. I've always had a degree of anxiety when it comes to illness. and Believe me, I don't have even to be ill. Because of this, my sister, who is a nurse, has banned me from having and reading medical dictionaries because by the end of reading about those symptoms, I've convinced myself I have got the illness. So you can imagine the war that was going on in my head the day that this virus began to circulate. I just wanted to lock myself away in the vicarage, my own, if you like, little panic room until it had all gone. And I doubt I'm the only one. Yesterday, I got a call, though, from a man in South Croydon who said that he had just come over from Ireland in his caravan with his wife and child. He had asked some other clergy to help, but apparently they'd said no. And so he said, please, will you help me? Oh, but he might not be genuine. 
He won't have washed his hands and he might even have the virus. Don't I have a duty of care to my elderly parishioners? And why did he ring me anyway? He's not in my parish. There were so many reasons for me to stay in my panic room. Was I fearful? Did I use a double dose of alcohol gel when I got back into the car? Yes and yes. But how could I not go? Of course, we must all do what we can so as not to put ourselves and others at risk. Yet at the same time, isn't the fundamental call of the church to sit with those at the well who need us where they are at? With many places of worship suspending their services and closing their doors, people are asking, should we even come to church? Maybe thinking that that reveals a lack of faith, a diminishment of solidarity when the world needs the healing words of Jesus the most. But this virus may be with us for a while. Some of our family, our friends and our neighbours may get sick and they may even die. And so as followers of Jesus in this time of crisis, what should we do and where should we be? You know, the heart of the gospel message is that God emptied himself of everything, but he still remained God. As churches literally empty themselves, God's presence is not diminished. The church remains the church, be it gathered or scattered. Some of our congregation here at St Mary's, this parish and our neighbours need to stay at home in order to be safe. And that is not a lack of faith. It is being sensible. And so our call at this time may simply be to drop shopping off on a doorstep or to give somebody who is at home on their own a telephone call to let them know that they are still very much a part of our church family. At some point, we will all die, be it through a virus, a cancer, a heart attack, or simply because we have grown too old for our bodies to work anymore. Five-year-old James was in the kitchen as his mum made dinner. She asked him to go into the pantry and get her a tin of tomatoes, but James, he didn't want to go in alone. It's dark in there, mum, and I'm scared, he said. It's okay, his mum said. Jesus will be in there with you. So James walked hesitantly to the door and slowly opened it. He peeked inside, saw it was dark, and started to leave, when all of a sudden he had an idea. He leaned in and said, Jesus, if you're in there, would you hand me the tin of tomatoes? <laughs> Fear strikes us at the very heart of our being, be it because of a virus or any other number of things that might frighten us. You'll remember from the Lent 1 reflection that I gave a few weeks ago, the fear was right there at the very beginning when God came in the cool of the evening for his afternoon walk with Adam and Eve. When they weren't there, he asked, where are you? To which Adam replied, I was afraid, and so I hid. When fear creeps in, we may be tempted to hide in our own panic room. When all the what-if situations begin to consume our mind, it's then that we need to remind ourselves that God has not left us and that we are his church and must not leave each other either, even when we no longer gather in one place together. Psalm 46 says this, For God is surely our refuge and our strength in trouble. In 2 Corinthians 12 we read, For he promises to provide us with his all-sufficient grace for every trial that comes our way. And in Psalm 40 we read that it's in these moments of fear that all we need to do is to wait upon God and he will incline his ear and hear our cry. Knowing that no matter how awful our current trial may seem, God promises to use everything together for the good of those who love him. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.